Let me ask you a question. Which disease do you think causes the largest amount of combined morbidity and mortality in the United States today? Cancer? Diabetes? Heart disease? You may be surprised to learn that is stroke. Every year, 600,000 people suffer ischemic stroke. Every 40 seconds, the American Heart Association has said that a stroke occurs. Since I started talking, somebody has had a stroke. So, what does a stroke look like? I'm going to make everybody in the room a radiologist for just a second. This is a stroke. The gray part is the normal brain. The white part is the affected brain from the stroke. What does a stroke look like on a person? F-A-S-T, fast. F for face, which is an asymmetry in your face. A for arm, a weakness or numbness. S for speech, which is an inability to speak altogether or garbled speech. And T, T is time. When you see somebody with F, A, or S, you need to call 911 and get that patient to a hospital because with stroke, time is brain. Every minute, 1.9 million neurons are affected. That is 32,000 neurons every second. So even though we have 600,000 people affected every year by stroke, Compared to other diseases, until very recently, it's been the forgotten illness. So what is there to treat stroke? Let's take patient number one. He comes to the emergency department, he can't move his arm, he can't move his leg, and he can't speak. It's been two and a half hours since his last known normal. They do a CT scan of his head, and there's no bleed. They look at his strict criteria, and he meets the criteria. And he gets a clot-busting drug called TPA. TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator, was developed and tested in 1995 and shown to have an impact in improved people who suffer an acute ischemic stroke. The problem with it is actually its activity. While it breaks up a clot, it also causes bleeding, and that bleeding is in the brain. As a result, there is a strict time course at which you have to give the TPA after that patient was last known to be normal. Initially, it was three hours, and then it was expanded to about four and a half hours. Not only is there a time limitation, but there is 22 criteria that if you meet one of those exclusion criteria, you can't get TPA. As a result, of the 600,000 people that suffer a stroke every year, about 60,000 or 10% get TPA. And this was the only therapy available from 1995, literally until 2015, 20 years later. And there was a breakthrough. Patient number two comes in with a weak arm, a weak leg, and he can't speak. It's been five hours since his last known normal, so now he can't get TPA. They get a CT scan of his head, and there's no blood. They do a second CT, which has contrast going through, and we see that there's a clot right in one of the major vessels of the brain. Someone like me goes in through the femoral artery, goes up the aorta, through the carotid artery, gets into that brain vessel, and takes the clot out with a stent retriever. That's called a thrombectomy. Two hours later, that patient can move his arm. Three hours later, that patient can move his leg. And two days later, that patient walks out of the hospital as if nothing ever happened. Five clinical trials in 2015 showed that this was an effective means to treat acute ischemic stroke patients so long as you have a large vessel occlusion i.e. there's something to go after. 
Unfortunately, in 2017, only about 18,000 people qualified to get this. So do the math for me. 600,000 strokes every year. 60,000 strokes get TPA. And to make it a round number, let's say 20,000 strokes undergo a thrombectomy. That's 520,000 patients every year that we have nothing to offer acutely. Let's take patient number four. Patient number three now has a weak arm, a weak leg, and can't speak. It's been five hours since his last known normal, so he can't get TPA. They do a CT scan of his head and he has no blood. And they do a CT angiogram, the CT with the contrast, and there's no big clot there. What can we do for him? So when I was in medical school, I learned about this disease called von Willebrand's disease. And von Willebrand's disease is where you don't make enough von Willebrand's factor. You either don't make enough of it or the amount that you make is not made right. And 80% of these patients have what's called type 1 von Willebrand's disease. And in this patient population, they don't walk around bleeding everywhere. But if they were to undergo a minor surgical procedure or have a dental procedure, they would bleed more than you or I. And I thought, hmm. Then when I was in graduate school, I learned about these molecules called aptamers. And aptamers are single-stranded DNA or RNA that folds into a three-dimensional shape, binds to a protein, and inhibits its activity. The cool thing about aptamers is you can design a second RNA molecule that'll bind to the first RNA molecule and turn it off. An antidote. So what we did is we designed an aptamer that bound to an inhibited VWF and designed an antidote that could turn it off. The aptamer literally mimics the activity of von Willebrand's disease, but we're able to control it with the antidote. So this is how we tested it. We took mice and we created a carotid occlusion, a blood clot, and we gave them one of three therapies. We either gave them a negative control, or we gave them TPA, which is the clinical standard, or we gave them our aptamer. And you can see from the graph behind me in the silver or gray group, that's the negative control. Nothing really happened. In the blue group, which is the TPA group, you saw something happen, 25 to 30% started to open up. And if you look at the red group, or dare I say, scarlet group, <laughs> the aptamer treated group, you can see recanalization to 75 to 80%, and that 75 to 80% held through throughout the experiment. So then what we did is we took it a step further. We said, okay, I wonder what the carotid arteries look like. And you don't need to be a pathologist to appreciate that in the control group, you had complete occlusion. In the TPA group, you largely had occlusion. But in the aptamer treated group, the vessels were wide open. We took it to a third step then. And we tested the animals who got our aptamer, and then who got the aptamer, and then the antidote. And when we tested them, the animals that got the aptamer and then the antidote looked like they had never received any drug at all. So I want you to understand one thing. This type of science and research does not get done in a vacuum. It requires protein biochemists, RNA biochemists, animal modelers, veterinary scientists all coming together. The idea of translational science, which is taking a scientific principle and applying it to a disease process in order to achieve a therapy that has a beneficial outcome to patients, is team science. And this story hasn't been written yet completely. As we move to preclinical and clinical trials, we will need pharmacokinetic specialists, pharmacologists, clinical trial specialists, biostatisticians, bio, uh, all to make this go forward. 
Now dream with me for a second. My drug makes it to clinical trials and is successful and treats a fraction of the population that suffers from acute ischemic stroke. And patient number four comes into clinic. And it's been two weeks since his last known normal. And he can't move his arm, and he can't move his leg, and he can't speak. And his daughter is with him at the clinic appointment, and she says, Doctor, will my dad ever speak again? Will he ever walk again? It is important for us to realize that we need to go outside of our own silos and scopes of knowledge to come together and work towards solving problems in, as complex as strokes in order to be successful. And when I look at patient number four, and I look at his daughter, who is actually patient number five, because she follows up with the next question, the fact that this has happened to my dad, will it happen to me? I turn to you to answer that question. I turn to you who are the future biochemists, the future physicians, the future brain machine interface specialists, the future biochemists. I want to hear your ideas. I need you to form your teams and work together to find solutions that will affect patient number four and affect patient number five and the 520,000 other patients that occur every year so that we can find solutions to treat this most debilitating disease. I can't wait to hear your ideas, and I really look forward to working with you. Thank you.